I don't think in Europe we built such a major research facility on a greenfield site since the 60s. We are building a European research center, but it's to be used by the world. And it has three components. Science Village Scandinavia, it will house all the users, but also the companies that want to profit from this environment. Uh, Max Lab, uh, this is maybe the single most important reason that the decision uh, to build ESS was taken in favor of Lund. It it uh, permits us to do research with light, and this is complementary to the research that we are doing at ESS. And finally then, the ESS facility itself. And uh, this is taken a uh, few months ago, and progress is very fast, and uh, it's actually halfway up now. We started construction 2014, and we will uh, have first beam on target 2021. Then after that, we start the user program in 2023, and we will be completing construction 2025. So why do we do these two facilities? Why is MaxLab the single most important reason for ESS to be built here? This uh, tries to illustrate it. On the top, you have the cross-section for elements for X-rays. And in the bottom, you have the cross-section for elements with neutrons. Cross-section just tells us how much do we see of a certain element. And if you start with the very light ones, you see that light has difficulty seeing hydrogen while it is enormous for neutrons. Basically, this explains all. We have an almost inverse relationship between cross-section in these two areas, and that gives us the strength of doing complementary research. This is a detailed plot of these cross-sections, and, and in red is the cross-section with neutrons, and in blue you see the cross-section with light. The light cross-section is simply set by the number of electrons, and that's why it's a simple straight line. With neutrons, we have nuclear effects, and this gives another important feature of neutron, that is uh, next uh, neighboring elements. So, uh, because uh, neutrons tend to pair up in the nuclei, you know it's a fundamental particle, uh, an element like manganese and iron can have very different cross-sections, which permits us to actually see these two elements as two separate entities, where we otherwise would have mixed them up if we used light. A few uh, examples, I am starting with the complementarity. This is uh, ember wheat seed. It was found during the archaeological digs at the ESS site. It's about 6,000 years old. It was found in a waste pit from a Neolithic um, people who lived on the ESS site. It's an image done with X-rays, with a light source. This is the same emmerweed seed, but now done with neutrons. And what is in blue and red is neighboring elements. This research is not just fancy to show pictures and see how we differently see these two things, but it's a real research project and it's trying to identify enough the, the DNA in this MAV seed to be able to sequence it. Because what we would like to know is 11,000 years ago we started, you know, uh, with, with, with uh, wheat in Mesopotamia. 6,000 years later, we are in Scandinavia, or 5,000 years later, what, um, uh, what happened on the way? Did it come gradually over Europe? Did it come in big jumps? Can we see that in the sequencing? Another interesting thing is that this emmer wheat was malted and roasted, so it was probably the leftovers of a Stone Age beer. And um, so it might be the first Lund beer in uh, history. Uh, another picture to show the complementarity. In grey to the left, you have an image of a tooth that has been extracted and it's been mended, as you can see, twice. But you can see there is cavities. And these cavities are clearly visible with light, but what light can't see if there is water in these cavities. And to the right is a neutron image. We have less neutrons, we don't get the same resolution, but those that are filled with water, they are red. And we can then do research on improving these kind of materials. The reason why we see neutrons are so beautiful and so remarkable is that a neutron can be a wave, but it also has a magnetic moment, and it's a particle and it's neutral. This gives its unique properties to study materials. Structure, this is an image of a structure. We are doing diffraction or even spectrometry, and we can then see the structure of the material. Magnetic moment, it means we can measure the magnetic properties of a material. This is a high TC superconductor. Uh, It'll be a breakthrough the day we have them at room temperature. This is a step on the way. Finally, the fact that it is a particle, a neutral, means we can do imaging, just like we do with X-rays. 
Uh, you can probably see that this coffee pot in aluminium is boiling. What this shows is just the strength of neutrons. If you had done this image with light, we would not be only seen the aluminium, but with, because of the inverse uh, cross-sections, with neutrons we actually see what happens inside this vessel. We can see the coffee cooking. And um, uh, I could have taken another example, I realized, which is much closer to what you do, and that's fuel cells. There's a lot of research using neutrons on fuel cells to study how the clogging in the membrane in the fuel cell uh, happens and what, what it comes from, or the ice formation in the membrane, uh, which actually lowers the, trans uh, the, the efficiency dramatically for a fuel cell. So uh, diffraction and spectrometry, these are the fundamental workhorses of uh, neutrons. Uh, complementarity, when we're going to do better drugs, this is carbonic anhydrase. It's very important for regulating the pH value in the blood. And um, what you see here is the structure basically made with light. But then if you actually want to study uh, a pharmaceutical, an inhibitor, and here you can see uh, uh, an inhibitor that is developed. And what you want to see here is how it binds to this enzyme. And the one proton bond, again, is almost inaccessible for light sources because all these other elements around will shine it out. So they will have to deduce where this bond is. But with neutrons, you can actually measure it. Uh, so this is a motor from uh, BMW in Gershing uh, being measured with neutrons. And the research project aims to study lubrification in this motor. And what you see in black is not metal, it's the oil. It's where the oil is. And you can even see the oil droplets flying back and forward in this image. So again, it's the complementarity. It's the fact that you see an inverse proportion. It's neutral, the neutrons, so it goes through this heavy motor and it sees actually the light elements inside the heavy motor. Well, the joints. So um, this is an Australian research pro project on pipelines. And uh, here you can see how they put in such a pipeline and a weld and studied both the tension and the structure of this weld to assure that they have the right annealing process in place to make sure that this weld is not with built-in tensions to eventually break later uh, during the use of it. If we can look a bit on the visions, the things that we can address in the future, high TC superconductors, I think we all agree it will be a paradigm shift for our society once we can get them to work at room temperature. Hydrogen storage substrates, a lot of research is going on there to develop. We know that if we have a metal, we can squeeze in as much hydrogen as we have metal atoms into this block, but it's very difficult to get it out. So to use it as a battery in a fuel cell driven car is not so easy because we have to get this uh, hydrogen out. Efficient membrane for fuel cells, flexible and highly efficient solar cells. Liquid membranes, this is in cells. This is, uh, neutrons is one of the few ways that we can actually see the transport within a membrane in a water environment in the body. So this refers to that. Self-healing materials, it would be wonderful if, uh, if, you, if you happen to uh, collide with your car, you could just park it in the sun, it heals out. It's not science fiction, we know it can be done, but we cannot do it on an industrial scale today. Uh, Protheses, that we are not yet, that we could influence it with heat or light from the outside, get them to heal. But again, it's not against laws of nature, we can handle that. Spallation, what is spallation? It's a stonemason term, so it comes from a stonemason hitting a stone block. The hammer for us at ESS, if I take the comparison, are the protons that the accelerator accelerates that I'm responsible to build. And we drive these protons with an accelerator. And then we have RF systems, radio wave systems, for actually drive the protons in the accelerator. And then we hit the target. In our case, it's a tungsten target, or Wolfram, if you say in Swedish, even though the Latin name tungsten is Swedish. It's a bit odd. But anyway, uh, when we do that, there is spells flying away from this stone block. And these are the spells that we capture. Among these spells are a lot of neutrons. Those of you who remember the basic nuclear physics course that many engineers have followed, remember that heavy elements need a lot of neutrons to glue together. Light elements need, need much less neutrons per proton, which means that if we 
break a heavy element, then we get a surplus of neutrons. <laughs> so we basically mine neutrons out of heavy elements. So if we then go to the facility itself, uh, we have a proton source. This proton source is a hydrogen bottle, and we uh, put it into a plasma to generate uh, free protons. And then we accelerate them in a linear accelerator. It's a straight line, not like Max Lab round. It's a straight line. Then we shoot on a target, and this target is in tungsten. It's a rotating wheel, and then we capture around the target the neutrons. Uh, all the other charged particles that spallation creates, they get stuck in the target. They can't get very far. They are not neutral. But neutrons can fly out of the target, and on each side we have what we call a moderator. And it's frozen deuterium. And this frozen deuterium shines like a light bulb, but it's a light bulb of neutrons. And this is the light bulb that all the instruments look at, and they are distributed close and far from the facility. This is the most powerful proton source in the world when it is finished. This is the tunnel, this is the gallery. Uh, when, you, when you go in Brunsög, you will not see uh, the tunnel because we have created a green roof which uh, should melt into the landscape and we're actually reproducing a, an old uh, height on the fields here. If you're on the motorway, you can see the facility. A lot of this is underground. If you go underground, we have an iron source. This is at some stage when we completed the installation. So it's reality already. We are putting things on site and we are getting beam into it. We are going to inaugurate it for the state visit 15th of November. So I'm not permitted to show you a picture of the beam because officially we don't have it until a member of the royal family has said so. But you can see the plasma. And uh, this is the plasma in the iron source. Uh, this is this little dot over there. So we're actually running equipment for real and we have operation of the facility. When it comes to the target, this is an image of what the target will look like. It's a two and a half meter tungsten wheel and it rotates. <laughs> so the beam you shoot is every 14 seconds hitting another sector of this tungsten target. This is to avoid it melting. At the same time as we are distributing the beam over the target, we are rastering the beam over the target. And this uh, is housed in a monolith, and you can see the monolith on site. This is just a recent picture, and we actually, the armature of this is on the level of what you have at a nuclear bomb-proof bunker. So we are very careful to make sure this is safe. Actually, one of the big challenges we have faced is the change of legislation in Europe. We have the antagonistic threat and Fukushima, which has put extreme demands on such facilities and there should be no reason anyone in Lund to ever fear that anything would come out of ESH. Even for the uh, H4 events, as, uh, as the Radiation Protection Agency, agency classifies, which is events that happens every millionth year. And that is, for example, an earthquake, in major earthquake in Lund. If you want the sales pitch of ESS, these are all the other facilities in the world. And you can see ESS will be the most bright and powerful facility in the world when it is in full operation. We believe it's bright enough to actually have paradigm shift in the measurements we can do. And this is, of course, the ambition to be world leading as a neutron research facility. 1.8 billion euros is it the biggest investment ever in science in Scandinavia. Uh, in modern time it is, but Tycho Brahe, he was better than us. So he persuaded the Danish king to invest 1% of the Danish king's budget in 1580 for his second observatory on the island of Wien. I'm sure many of you have visited it. And how did he actually do that? Well, he told the king he could make better horoscopes. The king wanted to know the future, he wanted to know if his son was going to marry happily, if the kingdom was going to grow. And uh, Tycho told, if I can measure the position of the stars better, then I can give you better horoscopes. You can ask if Tycho really believed in astrology. He wrote in a letter that he didn't believe in it, but we don't know where he stood really on this point. The point was, of course, that he, he eventually predicted in a horoscope that the king would lose a war and his son was married unhappily and he was thrown out and, you know, he left for Prague. But um, it turned out that both things happened. The king lost the war and the son married unhappily, so, so he was probably right there. So maybe the position of the stars. But the important thing is, of course, not that. The important thing is that Tycho Brahe 
from uh, three or four published observations of stars before he started his work. We had 3,000 when he died. And uh, this laid the ground for Kepler, and that changed our picture of the universe and put the sun in the center. So, you know, it would change our whole world, image of the world, what Tycho did. And um, it was not what he set out to do. And this is maybe a lesson for these facilities. If we do create world-leading research instruments, it might not would be what I can stand here and guess about. It might be totally different things that come out. And it is important to let that innovation, that ID, the spirit of it, work away, both in industry and in academic users. So thank you very much.